Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and I'd like to introduce my guests today. I'm very happy to have on my program Faye Salt. Hello. Faye is on the board of directors of the Historic Beverly. Welcome, Faye. Thank you. And I have Mark Foster, and Mark is the director of the Massachusetts Task Force One. That's correct. Uh, here in Beverly, and we'll learn a little bit more about that as uh, the program goes on. And um, I'd like to just uh, uh, tell our viewers that we are coming up uh, very shortly, uh, in a couple of months, on the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 uh, attacks on the uh, Twin Towers in New York City. And uh, to commemorate that, uh, uh, that event, we are going to have some uh, some events here in Beverly, and maybe, uh, Faye, you can uh, tell us about what, uh, what uh, the city has planned and what you and Historic Beverly have planned for that. Sure, Walt, thanks. So on September 11th, up at the airport and Mark site, we are going to be having a public open house. Everyone's invited. The gates will open at 11 o'clock. There'll be a welcome program, some speakers, some information, about the site, and then a site tour, where Mark and his team will be guiding us through a lot of their training and what they do there and why it's important, not only in this subject, we're talking about the 20th anniversary of September 11th, but also to the city of Beverly. Right. And it's, it's called the Mass Massachusetts Task Force One Urban Search and Rescue. Is that, that's the full, that's did correct. I get that right, right Mark? That okay. is. All right. And... Um, and, you know, a lot of folks uh, uh, are not aware that your team members uh, were some of the first to arrive at Ground Zero after, after the terrorist attacks. And um, I'd like to kind of uh, go over that with you. And we have some slides we'd like to show our viewers to show the response and, uh, and how you arrived on the scene and what you saw when, when, when you arrived there. But the first, I want to show the first uh, image, Zach, if you could, number one. Uh, and this is an image I think that everyone who was alive here in the country has seen from one angle or another. And this is the, the moment that, uh, of the second uh, impact uh, on, on the tower there. The first one was, uh, was up in smoke, and this is the, as, at the moment of impact. And... Uh, Mark, what, when, when that event happened, wh where were you uh, and what were you doing? How did you get the news and, and how did they give you the, the, uh, the order to, uh, to uh, deploy? Well, uh, I was down in the uh, Plymouth area at the time on some business and somebody called me when the first plane hit and said that the plane had hit. And I said, okay. And I remember that uh, the plane had hit the Empire State Building just after World War II, it was a bomber, I think, that hit the plane. So I said, well, it probably was somebody that was uh, off course or something that hit the plane, uh, building by accident. And I didn't think that much of it. To keep it in the back of my mind, but I, I still thought it was uh, going to be a rather nothing incident, so to speak. And then I uh, had stopped at the, uh, I believe it was the Plymouth Airport, and I was in there watching the TV. It was a little uh, black and white TV sitting there. And it had little antennas with a uh, tin foil on them because they don't get TV well real down there. And as I'm watching the TV in the tower burn, I see this plane come across and hit the second one. And I think anybody who saw that knew exactly what was think, happening. Yeah, and you knew that it was very... And I, I kind of yelled out something. Somebody told me to be quiet. They were taking a pirate's exam or something. But I said, uh, no, something big's happening. You've got to come out and watch the TV. Yep. So I started heading home. And uh, on the way back, I uh, called uh, the... Uh, one of our rescue team managers, and he said he had heard the same thing and he was going to get the team ready. So I tried to call Washington, and by then the lines were all tied up to Washington. So I had a friend at the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency in, in Maine, and they had a special line to Washington. I get to Maine, they got to Washington. I called Washington, they said, what to do? And they said, you're probably going to go to New York, so you can get ready to go. So I told everybody on the team we we're going to get ready to go, and everybody used every kind of Communications are manageable. There was phones, and they got on the fire networks, and they mentioned the team was going. We got everybody up there by about 1 or 2 o'clock, and mm -hmm. by the time 
4 o'clock rolled around, we were on the way. Yeah. And you were escorted. We have a, a slide number two, uh, Zach, if you could put that up. And so uh, you, were, you were escorted down by, by uh, state police, et cetera, right? So how many, how many people from your, from your group went down? Well, back then, a, a type one team, which is what they called us, uh, had 75 people on. So there's 75 people. There's two school buses there, which is another interesting story. Maybe I'll tell you sometime okay. about how we got school buses involved. But the two Beverly school buses took us down, and we had a bunch of trucks we owned at the time, and they made it down there. And I think we had probably 12 trucks and two school buses and 72 people. Yeah. And now we have a couple of, of images here, three of them, three, four, and, and five, Zach. And th th this is kind of what you saw Mark, tell us, what, what was your impression? What did, what did you see, and how, how did you feel when you first went down there, your, when you first got to Ground Zero? Well, see, uh, you probably don't have any images of when we first got there, because we got there at 9 o'clock at night, and I went out on the pile at 11, and uh, I didn't bring my camera with me, so it was dark. We spent about a half an hour there, and they told us to go back. And one of the strange things about 9-11 was the first night, very few people worked the first night. You would think so, but it would be different, but the New York City Fire Department, Police Department all kind of burnt out from the day and they regrouped the, the next morning. So mm -hmm. we went back the next morning and we were told by FEMA and the local authorities down there to go back. We go in in the morning. Next morning we went about 9 or 10 in the morning. It looked just like you see now. And everything was... Uh, uh, covered white dust. Now, these photos are probably later in the week, but very early photos of the first three days there were, it was dust in the air, very dusty. Yeah. And, of course, now it's all re related to people having kind of breathing problems and stuff at the time. Right. We did have some masks at the time, but nowhere near what we needed. And uh, all the thing was on the very first day after, that would be Tuesday morning, there was virtually no uh, scene control, so everybody was there. Every police and fire and, and fire departments from Long Island and fire departments up in state New York. It was quite crowded, and people was uh, running around, and there was no real control. Or yeah, that yeah. that came on the second day. Things got a little bit buttoned down by then. Yeah. Now we have a couple pictures here of uh, of some uh, fire trucks, and I believe that these were the fire trucks that had initially responded to the to the fires and so forth. And, and th of course, when the, when, the, when the towers came down, they were sitting there in the street, and you can see the, the burned-out hulks, this one and the, and the next one. Uh, it's almost uh, hard to distinguish what you're looking at here when you, when you see that. So uh, th were there a lot of vehicles like this that were clogging the, the, the streets? So well, it's an interesting thing. I always wondered why there was fires in all these trucks, because you'll notice the fires are always in the engine compartment, or they, they radiate from the engine compartment. And several years later, when we got money to buy trucks, I noticed that you could buy an option with a truck that was going to be used to fight fires in the wilderness for a special type of air cleaner that didn't have paper air cleaners. They were oil bath air cleaners. So what happens is for trucks that are in city service have paper air cleaners. Oh, so so when they suck an ember in, yeah, it the air up, cleaner yeah. catches fire, catches the engine fire, and that's what happens. So oh. most of the vehicles you'll see at, on 9-11 had a fire that started in the engine and propagated the rest of the truck. Wow. Yeah. And we have a picture of a, of a young man here who responded. And, uh, I know that man. You know that man, yeah. And that, that's you there in, in, uh, in front of the, some of the records, some of that that was standing there. Now, you also, um, uh, you guys were using dogs at the, in, in the rescue. Did, yes, did, we did took you bring any of, of your dogs with four you? Four live fine dogs down there. Now, one of the issues is that uh, there's dogs are trained to find live people and the trained dogs to find human remains. Or, or, yeah. And uh, one of the uh, things people ask me is how come, because we use live find dogs for all eight days. And somebody said, well, how can you use a live find dog to find human remains? And it was very easy because one of the handlers, Mark Alberti, who'd been a wonderful handler for many years, I asked him, I said, Mark, how can you find a live dead person with a live find dog? He says, well, my dog is trained only to bark at live people when he find a live person. He says, and when, when I, if I barked at a a scent that was a wrong person uh, or wasn't a live person, he'd get punished. So he said, oh. I could tell my dog because he used to put his tail between his legs oh, wow. and he'd be smelling a person that was dead or a oh. piece of uh, wow. uh, flesh there. And yeah. he, So most people have a uh, kind of a body language. They can understand a dog. So a dog wouldn't bark like they do for a live pine, but the dog did act strange. 
and after a day or two, you could tell it was and yeah, so it yeah. quite, quite a few human remains that way. Yeah. And they're doing that down there in uh, Miami today, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we'll looking. talk about that in a little bit. I, we'll, we'll, sure, we'll no problem. That, yeah. So let, let, let's look at the next slide. Uh, and um, it was pretty, you know, here's a guy kind of jumping over. It was pretty dangerous up on those. Uh, what, what kind of guidance or what did they tell you about how, how dangerous or what you should or shouldn't do when you were there? I believe that's Paul Carey from Boston Fire. He's a team member and he's, he was a team member up until several years ago. So I don't think he's jumping. He's moving pretty slow and carefully. Um, that is, and it isn't up in the air, that's actually subgrade. The, the collapse of the center of the World Trade Center was a, a four or five story parking garage, and there was a plaza on that, and the plaza collapsed down in the garage. Yeah. So when you look out there, he's probably got four or five stories of uh, uh, rubble and debris below him. Yeah. So he's moving very slowly and carefully, and uh, there is no rushing when you do that. You just take your time, yeah. move very slowly. Yeah. And thoughtfully. Yeah, and I think the next uh, slide we have, I think we, we have a picture of, of some of the dogs. Okay. Now, uh, th th those That's were Lee Prentice and Mark Allaberry. Lee was from, uh, he still is from Ipswich, and Mark is from Winthrop. They have the two dogs. It's Moxie and Tara. Those, both those dogs passed away about five, five years ago, maybe even more, six years ago. Yeah. Dogs have a, obviously a lifespan of maybe 20 years. And it's been 20 years. I know. I don't believe that there are any log, dogs alive from the World Trade Center anymore. Yeah. But uh, they're taking them in there now. They have them on a leash, but if you see the dog working, they always work off the leash, and they don't even wear a collar because your dog gets down into a piece of rubble, you can get hung up on the rubble with a leash on. Yeah. So anytime I you see a TV that says they got a trained dog, he has a leash or a collar or a vest, he's not working or he's not a trained dog. Right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes, you should or, say that. Yeah. Sure. And I think we have a couple of photos of uh, uh, of the rescuers here. Uh, well, no, this is uh, kind of like I guess you had to sleep uh, whenever you could. And well, you, you have to remember we work twelve hour shifts there. Yeah. So a twelve hour shift is from eight in the morning to late in the evening, and then it took uh, an hour to get there, an hour to get back. Cause we slept at the Javits Center that was down the road. Okay. And we worked. So it was almost a mile north of the Trade Center. So if you get, so they had to leave at 7 in the morning. Before 7, you had to eat breakfast, and there was a briefing. So you have to get up about, about 4 or 5 in the morning, and you get back 8, 9, 10. So you're getting 4 or 5 hours sleep maybe if you're lucky every night. And so yep. during the day, you try to grab sleep when you can. So let's see the next slide here. I think this is a group, yeah. And um, That's one of our rescue squads, and they're uh, taking a little downtime during the, uh, the event. And I think that's probably on day four or five. Yeah. It's really early on. And, and you can see event. that white dust, can't you, Mark? That, yes. that was kind of everywhere. And uh, yeah. you, you could see when, when in television when they showed the collapse, you could see those clouds of, of that, that, that gray-white dust that just permeated everything. So on Wednesday night, there was a thunderstorm that came through there, a huge thunderstorm. front came through there, and it rained and it poured, but it took all the dust out of the air, most of it. Yeah. So if you see a picture that's fairly, that, that picture's taking after Wednesday. If there's dust in the air, it's before Wednesday. Ah, interesting, yeah. interesting. And then, uh, let's see, we have another slide, number 13. Okay, and this is, uh, this is some of your team here, right? Yes. Uh, what do you think? Is that Kenny? That, uh, he... That's Tom Kenny, number two. Tom was a, a rescue team manager. He passed away last year of uh, cancer related to the the uh, Trade Center, and I think that's, ooh, you got me, I should have brought my little note, I'm going to tell you the other two people. I think that's somebody else's dog handle, because I'm not sure he's a 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. the, okay. the fourth person to the right, yeah. his dog. And I think now, uh, Faye, I have a, <laughs> we have a slide now, number 14. This is the, this is the memorial, uh, for those folks who don't know, this is a memorial um, at... Uh, the FEMA location at Mark's location, and this is where. Um, tell us about this is where the 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 uh, the uh, 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 or the the event will be held, and and there'll be speeches here. The mayor will be here, and so forth. T tell yes. us a little bit about that. Well, that's a, a piece of steel Mark. from the uh, North Tower, in the North Tower, and that's actually the ninety third, ninety ninety second floor, ninety third floor, and it's sheared off in the ninety fourth floor. And a shear in that piece of steel is made where the wing went through the tower. So uh, we got that piece of steel maybe eight or nine years ago. We went down, we applied. There was a 
a period where you could apply for memorial pieces of steel. We went down to the uh, hangar in New York City, and we picked it out. And it was good because that's what they call a tri-beam. A tri-beam has three pieces of steel held together by a band. There's two, and the third piece got torn off during the collapse of the tower. But it was the biggest piece we could fit on our truck, so we took it. And it sat around for a while. We had it in front of our building. We didn't know what to do. Finally, we uh, got together with an, uh, an architect from Hamilton, and he came up with this idea of putting inside a, a thing that looks much like this. Like this. It has a pentagon. There are five sides to that. There are three levels, which stand for the three plane crashes. It sits in the ground. When you go in here, you're actually a little bit below grade, and you feel like you're, there. you're not there. The other thing is, there's a ball. That you can't see it rolling, but in the front of that is a round sphere ball. That's a 2,000-pound piece of polished concrete that sits on a, a film of water, and the water comes up into the ball, and the ball turns. Yeah, it's amazing to see that thing because it's almost like an optical illusion. It's only held up by, what, about a half inch? Uh, oh, less than that, of water. Uh, of water, and it actually spins around. And you can actually, if you know, if you, know you can actually uh, manip manipulate it with your, with yes. your hands and kind of... And and, uh, and and stop it. So, but and, uh, so um, the other thing was that ball represents. If you ever see, a, I'm not sure we're gonna have a picture up here, but if, we were sitting on uh, Day Street, and in front of Day Street there was a plaza, and the plaza there was a sphere. It was called a sphere or the peace sphere, I believe. Right. It was yeah. The main yeah. Plaza. yeah. You can see it in some of the images. We don't have a picture of that, but you can see that that sphere. That, that in represents some of the, the peace sphere, and then the now the tower sits behind it, and the. The sphere means a lot to team members because when we were out there, you have to remember that sphere goes down four levels below grade underneath that. So people would say they were at 3 o'clock and down three levels. Yeah. Or at 4 o'clock and we're up to four levels. Yeah. And um, so that was the, uh, that means a lot. The ball means a lot to team members and it uh, means a lot to uh, right. the memorial. And also. this is actually right at your facility there. At uh, at the airport and people that that visit the uh, the event. Come if you to drive the... down the road coming in, the the steel sits right in front of you. And as a matter of fact, we're putting a flagpole now. There'll be a large flagpole behind it. Yeah, you can yeah. see it from quite a distance. Yeah. So so Faye, let me ask you. So what what is going to happen now uh, between between now and and the event on on September 11th? And how is the historical society going to be uh, involved with the with the uh, with the event? So what we we felt as I met with Mark and his team and it really trying to understand not only what we all know the broad picture of what happened on September 11th. What most of us don't know is what happened with Beverly, Beverly's team. But even going back from a historical perspective, most of us have no idea how that site developed, why is it there, what are the different events, historic events, right. that led to the development of that site and subsequently Task Force One Urban Search and Rescue? I think so, Faye should tell the story about the coin because that makes it all come together. Well, I will tell the story about the <laughs> well, coin let, if you want me to. Yeah, why, why don't you do that? I'm going to hold it up, if, okay. if you will, while you talk to it. And I'm going to ask our camera person to zero in on the coin and you can tell us about it. Okay. Uh, so what led to this is about two years ago, I was in a Historic Beverly trustee meeting, and periodically the collections committee goes through different items in the collection, and they had a list of things they could not specifically identify how it related to the city of Beverly. And when I came to this coin, I asked the collections committee, well, why don't, you know, what are you questioning this item for? And the reason was they did not know the story of Mark and his team up at the airport. And so as I explained the situation to them, I realized if I'm the only person in this room that knows this history, and we are, if you will, people of historic Beverly, we need to get this story out. People in Beverly and close by, the other cities around in a lot of Mark's team, people come from different cities and towns. Historic Beverly is always interested in bringing stories of the city of Beverly and its history to people. And I think that a lot of times people think of 
history is, you know, 200 years ago in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> and what we have to remember is history is yesterday. Yeah, that's right. And so this was 20 years ago. So I, the beginning of the year, I reached out to Mark and said, we'd like to partner with you to bring this to people. And here we are. Yeah. And that, the, the facility there, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a um, Massachusetts task force number one, and it is an urban search and rescue facility. And for our viewers, I did a little research. There are 28 of these uh, around the country. And the one in Beverly is the only one in New England. And I think the closest one, depending upon how you measure, is either New York City or Philadelphia. Right. So uh, 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 in, uh, you are the only single one uh, uh, ur search and urban rescue um, uh, uh, facility here in, uh, in New England. Uh, and, and now it's at the airport. So describe what you have out there. Describe what assets you have out there and, and, and well, what you you're to, capable of doing. Well, there's a little history to this, like Faye would say. It all started because the, the airport, the city had always had an emergency management agency. And Beverly's always been a little lead, and they always had vehicles and quite an active group of people. We had an ambulance. We've been doing the ambulance work at, for the city for quite a few years. And uh, we always had trouble finding a garage to keep stuff in. <laughs> so we, one time we were at the high school, and we got thrown out of the high school because they needed a garage for something. They were at Lynch Park, and they needed the building at Lynch Park for something. And Ken Lewis was the, working at the airport, and he says, I think I know where we can put it. He says, we have these underground silos at the airport. He said, if we can excavate a silo, maybe we can put it there. And he says, I don't think anybody wants to come here. So they went to the mayor, and they said, do you want this? And he said, no. The mayor said, I'll give you anything you want. You can have the land. He said, just don't ask for money. So he said, Okay. So we, uh, we had, um, I think the city got a bulldozer and they dug out a ramp and we blow out one side of the underground bunker. We stored our equipment there and we had a bunker that was there. We did all the emergency management stuff for many years. And then uh, there was an opportunity the federal government said, we're looking for people to go help us during a major disaster. It was right after Leoma, the Loma Prieta earthquake, if you remember, it was on the Ball, uh, they were playing the World Series out there. Yeah, that's right. The side that, the the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And one of the things the federal government, because they could always give enough money to the people that were affected, but they had no way of bringing, paying people who weren't there, fire departments who weren't there, to come in. Yeah. So they came up with this program. They took uh, 25 at the time departments around the country. We applied. We were the only team that applied from New England, and we applied as the city of Beverly, and we had a uh, organization called the North Shore Civil Defense Council. We had about oh, 15 to 20 communities that we used to work together. We all said we'd get together and do this. And FEMA thought it was a great idea. And before you know it, we were in the business. Yeah. And now you, you, you have people that can respond immediately. Like if you get a phone call, you have people that actually sleep on cots there. and they. Well, and usually what happens is we have to, like on 9-11, we'd call at 11 in the morning. We have to be on the road by 5 in the afternoon. Okay. So that's called a, like out of the blue type notification. Okay. Sometimes when we have hurricanes coming, they'll see the hurricane coming up the coast, and we'll get money from the government to stand by. So if we're going to stand by, we bring people in, and they get all the stuff ready. So we can cut that time down from six hours to four hours or less. Yeah. And they, they will stay overnight there, and they'll be paid by the federal government to get it ready. And then when we get the actual word to go, all the trucks are ready, the trucks are loaded, the stuff's ready, and it's all new stuff on the trucks, right. still ready to go. Right. Now, how, how many people... Can you reach out and muster for any given, uh, if you had to, like, could you reach out to two, 300? How many people can you? We have 252 trained people. Okay. So that means they're trained to the FEMA level of training. So you can walk on the pile and not get hurt. You can yeah. get uh, physicals. They have train, right equipment, right protective equipment. You know how to use the equipment and how to integrate with people. We have a incident command system. Now, with the 250 people, we only usually put an 80-person team out, so it's we really need about a three three people in depth. To, okay. So yeah. usually we have a person, lead person, and a backup person, and a person that's either in training or on the way out, and that'll that comes out about two fifty two. Yeah, and and their abilities go. Uh, you were, you mentioned earlier that you have some folks down at the condo collapse in Florida. Tell tell us about that. You have a structural engineer down there from your group that's actually the lead person for that for that function. Uh, Ivana Almazar is an engineer who's been with us for about fifteen years. She, we went down to uh, Hurricane Katrina with her. She's been to several other events, and she's a pretty sharp lady, and she's uh, 
She's one of the best. Maybe we can do an interview with her later. <laughs> okay. No, she's be coming back. She's still down there. They held her over because she's a lead engineer down there for eight. She has a team of eight engineers working for her. And uh, they're doing the after action report on Friday for the federal phase of the event. And she's going to lead the engineers on the federal phase. But we have, uh, I think, eight engineers. And we have, uh, and they all are uh, rated uh, structural engineers. They take a special course with FEMA to do FEMA stuff, and they're on our team. You know, we went to a Worcester fire, oh, probably 25 years, 30 years ago. At the time, the building was unstable, and there were firefighters working in the building. And they said, well, we don't need these guys from Beverly. We'll just get some local engineers. Well, engineers will tell you when something's safe. They won't tell you when something's unsafe, and you can work in unsafe <laughs> stuff. So that's the type of engineers we have. They can tell you how to work near something safe. You can't work there long. They know the Which odds. Which is they very important, the especially in a situation like... Bernie uh, Ruliad was our engineer at the World Trade Center, him and Alan Fisher. Yeah. And somebody, they were underneath that plaza about three levels down. They said, Bernie, is it safe to be here? He <laughs> says, no, it's not safe to be here. He says, just don't well, stay too t- long. Now you tell me, right? Now you also have an interesting uh, 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 function out there. You have, you have a, like a huge pile of of debris that you train uh, search and rescue dogs. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that pile actually was the, uh, remember the Beverly-Salem Bridge? Yeah. Well, most of the bridge is up there now in different pieces. Oh, okay. Pieces. <laughs> right. It's not the wood part, but they did some concrete, and they made some concrete parts on that bridge. And our chief engineer was the engineer for Chimbro Company that built the bridge. So we made a deal with them that if they, we inspected the bridge and it was clean concrete, they could move it up there, and they brought it up during that bridge construction. And it's, it's layered just like a regular building. Yeah. They, they have layers. with, with The big thing about stri- rush, r- rescuing people in a collapse is they're in a void. So the two pieces of concrete will fall. They don't call, right? They, they, they go canter. There's some in between, whether it's furniture. Yeah. Or and that's, of course, where they thing. look for, for people. And people that, stay in there. So yeah. that, um, that piece of concrete, that pile of concrete is probably 150 feet long, about 50 feet wide. That's a certified pile for training dogs on. <laughs> certified junk pile, right? There you go. <laughs> if we have a person in that pile, a live person, we have ways you can get them in there. A dog can find that person in three to four minutes. Wow. And, and they train and test dogs to that every, all yeah. the time. Well, Mark uh, uh, and Faye were, were quickly run out of time. This is such a this is such an interesting topic. Well, maybe I have to have you back on. I again. think you have to come out to the airport and see some of these things in person. Exactly. Bring your cameraman. On September 11th. Right. Well, or we before will, then. We will be there. BevCam will absolutely be there, uh, and we will be broadcasting. Uh, the the event live, and we will be streaming it, and then it'll be available VOD on our on our channels. But let's just take a look. If people want to get more information, uh, what we have a couple of URLs and things here, mm-hmm. and uh, this is the Massachusetts Task Force dot org, and that's the phone number. And we have another one for the Beverly Historical uh, or Historic Beverly. There's Historic mm-hmm. Beverly. And, and uh, that's the number. In. Now, Faye, mm-hmm. just to, to remind our viewers, what, yes. once again, give us the who, what, when of, of the event. Okay. So, again, September 11th. Yep. The gates are going to open at 11 o'clock in the morning. We'll all be assembling around 1130. There will be some welcome guests, some speakers, information. Uh, Mark's team will be doing some things. And then Mark's team and a team from Historic Beverly We'll be guiding people through the museum, Mm -hmm. around the memorial, and also some of the sites on the at the task force base near the airport. Wonderful. And in the interim, we'll be writing some articles, historic and other information along the way. So stay tuned. Well, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank my guests, Faye Salt from Historic thank Beverly you. and Mark Foster from the um, uh, Mass Task Force Number One. Urban Search and Rescue Team at the Beverly Airport. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank interesting. You, Walt. And uh, I'd like to remind our viewers you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.